In this video, I will give a presentation that is intended for an audience of people who are interested in learning the basics of machine learning, but who might not have the typical background of those who've studied machine learning. So you might not be people who have not studied computer science or statistics, but who might be put in situa situations where you have to consider whether machine learning is the right tool for your problem that you're trying to solve. So people who might be working in government organizations or in industrial positions that uh, have problems that can be solved with machine learning. So the plan for the presentation is that I'm going to talk about a method of machine learning called nearest neighbor learning. It's one of the simpler methods of machine learning, but it's actually very powerful. Then I'll give you a broader view of machine learning in two, two, different, two different perspectives on that. Um, then we'll talk about a core problem in machine learning that, that sort of overarches uh, and in, encompasses a lot of applications of machine learning, which is the problem of generalization. After that, I will give you a brief overview of deep learning, which is one of the uh, more prominent forms of machine learning today and something that probably anybody interested in machine learning now might have already heard something about. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a view into what exactly deep learning is. Finally, I'll talk about the cutting edge, meaning I'll talk about where we are today in terms of what we know about machine learning, uh, where we are going to, going to be soon, and just give you an idea of things that I think we're just never going to be able to do with machine learning. So we'll begin by considering a simple problem. So suppose you get a task of trying to guess a human person's age based on an image of their silhouette. And suppose to accomplish this task, we're given a, a few examples. So uh, look on the screen. We have a few examples of uh, people's images and their corresponding ages or the ages of the people who, who are being imaged here. So there's a person on the left who is 21 years old and rather tall, uh, a a crawling baby who's one year old and a, a running child who's uh, six years old. And once we have all these examples, um, our task might be to make estimates of ages from, on, on other people. So suppose we get this, this uh, new individual comes along and we want to guess that person's age. So one way to, I guess, simplify the, this, this problem is to, rather than think about the full image of the person or the silhouette of the person, we can just consider how tall they are. So consider that they're just boxes uh, of certain height, and we just assume that the widths are the same. Um, this is just a way to, to represent the problem in a simpler way. So one way to think of this problem is that this is, this is essentially a, a learning task. We are given some examples that we want to learn from on the left, and then we're, we're asked to apply what we learned on the right. And of course, machine learning is just having a machine that can do or telling a computer how to do this learning task. But uh, since we've managed to describe things relatively uh, numerically, we can actually begin to see how a computer could accomplish this task. So numerically, we can represent this essentially as a as a function. So something from kind of high school or, or middle school level math, where we assume that there's, we, we, we're looking at a function that takes in some value and outputs another value. Um, and the function in this case is, is something that takes in the height of an individual and outputs the age of that individual. So we can, we can plot this out. We can create a, a, a plot with two axes. So on the, along the horizontal axis, you have the height and on, along the vertical axis, you have the age. And I've placed the, and rather than writing out the numbers representing the age, I've placed them uh, vertically corresponding to where, you know, what, what I had written for their ages, which were one, I think six uh, and, and 21. So the, the new individual that we get, it, the, that is the, the, you know, the person on the bottom, uh, I've placed them roughly where their height would be, right? They're a little bit taller than the, than the, the other adult, the 21 year old adult. And, and so the question is then, you know, what do we think their age is based on this you know, simplified view of, of human growth? And of course, in this setting, we're going to remove the extra information, which is the shapes of the individuals. And now we're just, they're just points in this two-dimensional space. They're, they're points in this graph 
right? If you remember drawing these things out in graph paper, you can imagine doing that here. So you can kind of guess what we do here, but I, I'm going to show you a simple algorithm um, that, again, is a real algorithm that people use for machine learning. And it doesn't work so great with this small number of you know, three examples. Uh, so pretend we have more examples. So suppose, suppose we were given a database of lots and lots of individuals, uh, how tall they were and how, uh, and how old they were. So the, the strategy that we're going to take is that we're just gonna look for an example in our database that is similar to the example that we're trying to make a prediction for. So we're trying to predict the age given this person's height and we can find someone else in our data set who looks, uh, who has very similar height to this individual. And that's this point right here. So we could estimate that the age of this individual is exactly the age of that, of the dot from our data set, uh, the per person we've seen previously. Um, and that's our output, that's our prediction. And so you can imagine, you know, t telling, telling a computer to do this, right? They just have a data set and they just sort of scan through the data set and look for the individual in their data set that is most similar to the thing that we're trying to predict the thing that we're trying to infer. And as I said, this is, this is a legitimately good machine learning algorithm. The one problem or one, one of the problems it, it faces is that sometimes you get cases where you have an input that, uh, that there aren't very similar examples for. Uh, and for, for example, in this, in this case, suppose the blue line represents the height of an individual we're trying to predict the age of. Uh, in this case, there, there isn't a good choice like of which, which, uh, which dot we should use to to make our guess. So that's something to be aware of. This is a challenge for um, the nearest neighbor methods, but a way to fix this is to get more data. You could imagine having more dots and then you would have a kind of a smoother way to make these estimates. So to, to put it into words, the algorithm for nearest neighbor prediction is that you're given a data set of examples um, and the examples all have attributes uh, uh, connected to them. So in, the, in our simple, simplified example, the only attribute was height. Like we just pretended the only thing that describes an individual is it's that person's height. Um, and then there's a, a, attached to each, each example is a label, which is the, the, the target variable that we're looking for. And, and, and in, again, in the previous example, that label was age. Right? So we had attributes and in that case was height and labels, and in that case was uh, age. And for each input example, the algorithm will find the example in our data set that is most similar. Um, and and I put that in bold because I want to highlight it. There's a big question here about what that means. But um, but yeah, so, so once you find whatever is, example is most similar, then you, you predict the label of, the, of that most similar example. So as I said, this is like, this is a real machine learning algorithm. It's really simple, um, and it, it it can work really well in practice. Right? This this can be something that people may might actually use for deployed you know industrial systems. But it does it does come up with or does it does create some complications. So one of the complications you might face when using a nearest neighbor method is that uh, you might have multiple attributes. So suppose you have. Uh, you know, training examples that look like this. So now we have not just the height of each individual, but we also have their education level um, and their weight. And then, and then, and in this case, just there's only three attributes, but you can imagine there could be lots more attributes describing each sample. And when given a, uh, an example to make a prediction on, then again, the, the nearest neighbor principle is, natural. So it says, okay, let's look through our database of training examples of, of you know, the, the examples that we're used, we use to learn our, to learn our, our prediction, uh, to learn our, our, our idea of what a person's age is. Um, we look through all those examples and decide the one that is most similar to this last individual on the bottom. Um, uh, but, you know, you might start to look at this and wonder, how do we do that? And, and so there's some questions that, that come up. So one question is that the, these, these numbers, height and weight, right? These are numbers, which is good. The, the, the education is not a number, so that's a, maybe a problem, but although you could convert it to a number, but okay. Um, the, the height and weight, they are numbers, but they're not on the same scale, right? You can't really say that, oh, if, one per, if a person's uh, d different in height by, uh, if two people are different in height by one foot, uh, how does that compare to a difference in weight of, you know, say five pounds? 
right? How, how do you relate these different scales? And so this, that's not obvious. And so kind of the, you know, there, it does take some, you can, you can kind of sit there and look at the distributions of the numbers that come out in your data set and, and decide how to, you know, shrink or grow these numbers to scale them. So they're similar. There, there's lots of work on that. Um, but in general, we don't really know. We, you know, it really depends on the task. And this is one of the challenges that you have to face when doing machine learning in general, but especially for nearest neighbor methods. And similarly, the, the, you know, there's another challenge with, which comes from the, from this education attribute, right? If this this is this attribute is, uh, it, you know, it, the way that I described it, it it's a categorical feature, uh, meaning that, you know, each individual can have one of these, one or more of these categories, uh, that, you know, the different, uh, different educations. Well, I, I suppose it's only one because a lot of times when you fill out these surveys, you say things like, here's the highest level of education I've reached. Although that's, that by itself is already a flawed way to describe things because you could get multiple PhDs or you could get a PhD and a, you know, a JD and then which one's higher. It's not really clear. You could be an MD PhD. There's lots of ways that you can have um, kind of unclear definitions of what your highest level of education is. But in either case, how do we handle this, right? It, it's not, it's not obvious. So there's lots of schemes for doing that. And that, that comes from, uh, or that is representative of some of the challenges you have to face when deciding uh, how to handle these. So in addition to nearest neighbor methods, pretty much every machine learning algorithm has to deal with these challenges. So, so let me summarize. So machine learning algorithms, they are tasked to uh, answer these questions. So first you have to figure out how to scale continuous attributes with different units, right? So the whole point, if the whole point is to take some input data and make a decision based on that data, how do you, how do you treat the different continuous attributes in your input in your input data um, and how do you compare categorical attributes right we, we, we that's not so obvious so you can't really write down a mathematical formula for comparing categories um, and then there's also questions of you know which attributes are actually relevant and how relevant are they right are there some attributes that are more important than others uh, this is a core problem uh, and then lastly I, I, I list here I list here that we, that there's a question of whether we should combine attributes, um, and and this this really gets down to the question of like how do you represent how do you represent the individuals that you're trying to make predictions or decisions about? And in this case, you know, in the in the example I gave, I, I listed height and weight as different uh, as different attributes, but in some settings, you might really care about some kind of you know combined measure like body mass index, right? Which is which is a, a simple formula of of height uh, based on height and weight and in in many applications that's a more important representation of these key numbers than than just looking at them uh, as you know by themselves so I, I bring these up because near the nearest neighbor you know learning method is you know it is technically a learning method right it takes in some information it learns from it and then it's able to make decisions based on what it learned moving forward but even in you know, in, in that learning, there's all these complicated decisions that have to be made uh, for the computer algorithm to decide what is nearest when it comes to nearest neighbor. So that's just an example of a, of a very, you know, powerful but, but simple machine learning method. And in general, I want to talk about what is machine learning? Like what is it, you know, there, machine learning, as I said before, is kind of simply defined as learning with, um, you know, with, with a machine. But we should think about some of the things that are, common about the methods that people refer to as machine learning methods. Um, and so to do that, I want to bring up an, a simple example of, of coin flipping um, and how it relates to, to statistical learning, which is probably another another way of describing machine learning, depending, depending on which uh, community you come from. Right? If you're a statistician, oftentimes you, you think of machine learning as just a algorithmic description of statistical learning. And, and, and you know, there's different terminology that comes from different fields. But so I want you to consider this problem. So suppose you're given a coin uh, and I don't know, just to complete the picture with what I've drawn on the screen, uh, suppose you've got you've gotten one of these, you know, uh, relatively recent uh, state quarters, right? So you've gotten a quarter with the Massachusetts, Massachusetts um, map with a little picture of a Minuteman on the back. 
Um, so the tails side is not the standard tails of a quarter. So you might ask the question, with the fancy drawing on the back, do you still have equal probability of getting heads and tails, right? A, a coin is kind of the, the fundamental uh, example of a 50-50 probability. Right? People always say that, oh, it's a coin flip, right? Which usually means 50-50. Very rarely do you say to somebody, you know, really only statisticians would say something like, oh, it's a coin flip, meaning there's one probability of one thing. It could be like 70, 30. Uh, that's, that's probably not what people mean when they say coin flips. They usually say mean 50-50. But do we know if this is 50-50? Well, one way we can test that is to flip the coin a bunch of times. And so suppose we flip the coin uh, a bunch of times and we got 10 times that it, it came up heads and nine times that it came up tails. Um, and that's probably, that, that, that's okay. Uh, I just That could just, could have just been random fluctuation. And so it's like, it, it's po very possible. It's very possible that this is a fair coin or a 50-50 coin. Um, and suppose you did it a lot more times. So suppose you get, you know, 1,020 and 983, right? 1,020 1, heads, 983 tails. Uh, again, this is probably okay. It probably still could be uh, a 50-50 coin um, because of just randomness. But you might start to be a little bit more suspicious when you see uh, a more consistent trend of things being not fully equal. equal. Although just, I, I, made up, I made up these numbers and I think, I think that you know, the difference is off by less than 40. So I think it's probably still a fair coin based on if these numbers were real. In fact, this is probably unrealistically close. Anyway, the, the more important point is that what we're doing here is we're learning from independent draws from a fixed distribution. And that distribution is the probability of getting heads or tails uh, from a coin from a flipping this coin and what we're trying to figure out is 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 this coin generally fair right is this coin generally going to give us 50 50 and in other words we're trying to predict the probabilities of future draws from the same distribution right what we're not doing is trying to predict something about a different coin right if we if we flip the massachusetts massachusetts coin you know a million times and use that to estimate the probability of getting heads on the Massachusetts coin, you can't go and say, all right, we're going to use that. Now that we know that probability, we're going to use that on the uh, California coin, right? It, it, it's not the same distribution or it, we, we shouldn't assume it's the same distribution. So machine learning works the same way. Machine learning, it, almost every method in machine learning begins with the assumption that we're our training data comes from independent draws from a fixed distribution and that we're going to be applying it, uh, applying the, what we learn from the machine learning method uh, on some other data that will come from the same distribution. And this has important consequences on you know, when machine learning uh, works well in practice. So let's talk a little bit more about other general views of machine learning. So here I'm going to give you a, a simple example of sort of shape uh, edge counting. And I'll show you an, one way of thinking about what machine learning algorithms do. So suppose we have some training data, uh, which looks like this. So it's you, you, as input, you get a shape, uh, a simple shape. And, and, the, and the output is, is these numbers. And you might, you know, if, in this case, the, the numbers are uh, the number of edges of the shape, but that doesn't really matter. It, the point is that there's some mapping, you know, some relationship between these shapes and these numbers. So this is our training data. And then what machine learning does is that it has access to a bunch of functions. And, and these functions, I'm, I'm illustrating them as these arrows, right? These are functions that will take in a shape and will output a number. And so we have a list of them, or I shouldn't say list because it's not really ordered. So we have a bunch of them. We have a, a set of, of functions that, that we have to choose from. Uh, in this case, there's only six, but you could imagine settings where there's much more than six. And what machine learning does is it'll, it will essentially, its task is essentially to choose which of these arrows is best. Now, again, I already showed you that, you know, the red arrow represents the best one, but we don't know that the machine learning computer doesn't know that the computer all it knows is that it has access to all these arrows and it has all this training data so let's let's visualize what machine learning does so a lot of machine learning uh, methods specifically supervised learning methods uh, what they do is they 
they take the training data they, and they kind of hide the true labels. They, they hide the, you know, those numbers that, that were provided. Um, and instead they try to try to guess the numbers. They use the function to guess the numbers. So they pick a function, they try to guess the numbers and then they check which of the numbers are correct. So I've shaded in red, the numbers that disagree with the true numbers on the left. Right? So, so only one number was correct using the orange arrow. And the algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, essentially will try different arrows, try different functions, uh, keeping track of which one's best. So at this point, maybe you, you get this uh, green arrow, which does almost perfect. Right? It's, uh, it's gotten four out of five correct. And that's, that's exciting. And so at that point, uh, you know, a lot of machine learning algorithms might uh, be reasonably satisfied. But in this particular example, we found we know that there exists a function that gives us even better, even better matching with the, um, the true values. So we would choose this to be the output of the learning algorithm. And then so the the learning algorithm is the way of describing the computer program that is going to do the learning. Uh, but, but then the learning algorithm itself outputs essentially an algorithm, right? So the red arrow is an algorithm as well. The red arrow instead takes a uh, shape as input and outputs a, um, a, a number. So I think it's really useful to think about machine learning this way because it's, it's different from how we think about learning as humans usually. I, I don't think most of us think of learning this way, although I guess I suppose you could. Um, but you know, the way humans learn is much more, it feels much more natural. It doesn't feel like we're just like looking through a list of possible explanations and deciding on the one that finally fits the data. But when it comes to machine learning, the algorithms essentially boil down to that. So that's a, that's a sign. I think there's a general theme that I want to get across, which is that machine learning is not as smart as it might seem. Um, it's just got a lot of compute time available to it meaning you can uh, you know, spend a long time processing data or trying different models. Um, so of course this comes with challenges. And, and so the, the, there, there are two challenges that come across, uh, that, that come up with, with this view of machine learning. And one is that all we're doing is trying to match the performance, trying to match the outputs from the training data. Right? So we're giving some, given some examples, that's our training data. And, and, and we're tr we, can, we can train a model to match that, um, those outputs. And, but then the, the, the real goal though is not to just match that those the, those training examples right the real goal is to generalize to new examples so how do we generalize from the training data that, that that's a core challenge uh, the second challenge which just is kind of the another thing that most people spend their time on when they are, do machine learning research or machine learning engineering is how do you efficiently search through all of possible functions um, and you know what we'll, in some settings, you have a huge number of possible functions. And so the search needs to be smart. You need smart algorithms to search through that. And that's kind of the technical computer science or optimization theory, et cetera, uh, behind machine learning. But from a practical perspective, you don't usually have to worry about that. You kind of just think that you, you kind of just trust that the mathematicians and the researchers and the scientists have found ways to efficiently search through these functions. So you can just think of it as, you know, these algorithms get in as input, a training, a training set and output a function that fits that training set. But let's talk about generalization because this is a really important topic for uh, decision making when it comes to machine learning. So the idea behind the que or the question behind generalization is, is it, it can be illustrated with this example. So I can give you a perfect machine learning uh, method. Yeah, and let me put that in quotes, the a quote unquote perfect machine learning method um, that what it does is it takes the data examples and uh, it, it does this, right? If, if it gets a new example, when it gets a new example that it needs to predict something about, if it exactly matches a training example, then it outputs the label. Uh, otherwise, if it doesn't exactly match, it outputs nothing, right? So that, that's a pretty dumb algorithm, right? It does, it's probably not a very good one, but according to my previous description of machine learning, it will do really well, right? It, it, it's, uh, it's essentially just going to memorize the training set and output exactly what comes out of the, uh, what the exact outputs were in the training set when it gets those and, and otherwise do nothing or output some null value. So how do we describe how this is not good? 
right? So this doesn't generalize to new examples. That's true. Um, it, it essentially does perfectly well on the training set, but it doesn't do well on new data unless that new data happens to perfectly match the training examples. Well, to, to, to uh, account for this possibility, we, we really need ways to measure how well a machine learning algorithm generalizes. And one way to do this is with held out validation. Um, so consider this example. This is a classical machine learning uh, task, which is given these images of, uh, of digits, you know, numerical digits, try to predict what they actually are or try to try to estimate what they represent. Um, you know, so we as humans have been, or as people who've read these numerals for many apart, many years of our lives, we, we naturally know how to read them, but a computer just sees them as, as like pixels, right? There's just, there's just light pixels and dark pixels and, and it doesn't really know what the shapes are. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, can it learn to do that? So, um, so the idea behind held out validation is that again, if we just take this as a training set, we could just memorize, you know, everything in the first row is zero, everything in the second row is one, everything in the third row is two and so on. And that would do perfect on the training data. Um, and it would be, it would also do perfect if we get a new example where somebody drew exactly one of the twos, uh, in this training, in this training set. But if one pixel is off, then it doesn't know what to do, right? That simple algorithm doesn't know what to do. So how do we test that? Uh, the way that we do that is we split the data into a training set and a validation set. And, and by validation, we mean we're, we're going to validate the generalization of the, of the, of the uh, learning algorithm. So when you do that, you often get behavior that, that looks something like this. So you, you essentially need to measure the accuracy of, of, the, uh, of the, the learned model, the, the learned function, uh, on the training data, and then and then measure that val accuracy on the validation data. And remember, at training time, the training the algorithm the machine learning algorithm only has access to the training data, right? So th this is a inter interesting test where the machine learning algorithm only looks at the data on the left and learns something, and then it has to stop learning, right? Then it has to use what it learned to make a prediction on the validation data. So you might see something like this, where you have a simple model that you train and you fit it on the data on the left, and it does reasonably well, I guess 90, 91% of the examples correct. Uh, and then you apply it to the validation data and it only gets 83% of the data correct. And you know you might try a medium model where you get 95% of the examples correct on the training data, which you might be excited about because it's now doing better on the training data. Uh, and then it does better on the validation data as well, right? And then you, then you get 88%. And what you start to see is maybe you get a more complex model and in that case, you usually will see that the training data is even better, uh, even better fit, right? So you might get 99% accuracy on the training data, but you get 79% accuracy on validation data. So what's happening here? Well, in, in this totally made up example, what might be happening is something like I described before, where the training algorithm is ascent because it's so it's, it's trying to train a complex model. It's essentially just trying to memorize the training data and not learning how to generalize uh, beyond what's in the training data. And you know this could go further if you have a super complex model that can exactly memorize every pixel, uh, it might get 100% accuracy and then do really terrible on the validation data. So these are the types of tests that people need to do when they, you know, before they go and deploy a, a, machine, a, learned, a learned algorithm, a learned function. Right? So if they have a machine learning task, it's it's almost always a good idea to split off some data so that you can you can validate whether your machine learning algorithm is working well, and, and then even here uh, there might be some things you might you could worry about, which is that the validation data is relatively small, right? It's not it's usually you don't want to take off too much of the data for your validation, so it's usually some small fraction of your of your entire training set, and and what if your accuracy that you measure on the validation data is also kind of noisy? So what people do in this setting is something called cross validation, where you you split your data into different different what's called folds, uh, and you you train on everything um, in your training data except for that fold using and you, you hold out that fold for validation, and then you switch what which uh, which fold you're going to hold out, and so every single time you do, you know you do this, you hold out a different a different uh, fraction of your training set 
And what you get is, you know, multiple readings of how well your machine learning algorithm generalizes. So some of this stuff is somewhat technical, but it's, it's the kind of thing that, that is a very common mistake to leave out. It's often tempting to just, you know, train a model that really fits your data well, and then, and then you, you go ahead and deploy it, expecting it to work well. And, and procedures like cross-validation or just validation in general uh, are ways to try to mitigate that, that, that uh, pitfall. So, so I talked about the, this talks about the, the question of generalization, right? So, and, and essentially the solution is to go out and try to measure it empirically, right? Run experiments where you measure how well your method generalizes and then use that to decide whether you, you know, trust it. Uh, the other challenge I had mentioned before is that, you know, it's hard to search over different functions you might be considering, right? In that view where we consider machine learning just a search over which function fits your data the best. And that gets us to this idea of deep learning, which is, again, I mentioned before, it's one of the more prominent methods or, or principle, principles behind machine learning methods that, uh, that has shown a lot of promise in recent years. And it, it comes from the idea of artificial neural networks. And I'll say just the, the main ideas I want to get across here are that it, it allows for um, a, a smooth, gradual search over the different possible functions you might use, even in settings where the, the, the possible set of functions is really complex and there's lots and lots of ways you can come up with different functions to fit your data. But let's get into what deep learning is and what, neuro, what neural networks are. So neural networks or biological neural networks, you know, they control our, our brains and you know, everything behind our human intelligence and animal intelligence. Um, and, and the way that they, a simplified view of how they work is that they're essentially a bunch of uh, neurons that are connected to each other, right? or they have these these uh, axons, is what they're called. But they have they have these little uh, conduits that connect them to each other. And what happens is a neuron will send out an electrical signal uh, to all the ne other neurons that it's connected to, and some of those connections are stronger than others. So the the receiving neurons might get stronger signals from di from their different different uh, incoming neurons, and each neuron will then read its incoming signals. And, and if there's enough activity, enough electrical activity from those incoming signals, it will fire. And when it fires, it then sends out electrical signals to all of its connections. So, you know, there's a lot more going on in the actual, in actual neurons that, that involves, you know, chemical reactions. It's not just simple electricity, but, but that's a simplified view of what's going on. And uh, here's just an image of, um, an actual neuron. So the left is a cartoon. The right is an actual neuron lit up with a a dye, uh, a microscopic um, microscopy dye. So on on the, the on computers, these artificial neural networks, which have been around for decades, um, they were invented lo you know long ago. Uh, the idea is that you sort of simulate that behavior. So you 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 you, you designate certain parts, uh, certain variables to be your your neurons. Uh, and then they're connected to other variables, right? They're connected to other other uh, variables that are that are that will sort of give each other simulated electrical signals um, that that then are combined together at each neuron and just are decide and, and then that each neuron decides what value to send out to its uh, to to its the the nodes that the, the other neurons that it's connected to, um, and what you get is something that allows you to kind of iteratively process your data through multiple phases. Um, so you begin with your raw data. So what, what I'm drawing here, the X's are your raw data. That's your attributes describing the data examples. That's like your weight, height, uh, education level, you know, those raw values. Um, or it might be the pixels in the uh, image uh, understanding task, right? So it's just the raw pixels. Um, then what's happening is that the, these these intermediate neurons, the H's, uh, those will, rep you know, you can think of those as some representation of the data, right? The, the idea is that the raw data is not, not a good way to think about the data, but maybe the representation is, or at least the representation gives you an opportunity to, to, to quantify different concepts. 
Um, and then once you do that, you can then make some predictions based on the representation, based on the better representation. So an example of this, which uh, illustrates a lot of recent successes in deep learning, is that the inputs could be pixels, like I said, like just like pixels from your digital camera showing you the you know RGB brightness values at different locations on the lens, right? Then the the intermediate representation would be something more useful like shapes right so and then finally maybe the last bit is maybe you're using the shapes to predict or to, to identify where faces are in the image so this level of sort of multiple stages this or this multiple this idea of multiple phases of processing is um kind of the the whole idea behind deep learning and and the the hope is that you might be able to learn things like you know roundness or shadows um which better represent the data and allow the the you know the last the last decision you know whether this image has a face in it or not uh, to reason about what's considered high level features high level descriptions of the input yeah and the inputs from the top and goes to the bottom okay so then a deep neural network takes that basic idea so the, what i showed you before is just like two layers uh, it, there's, there was an input, a middle layer, and then the, the output. Uh, what, what happened in recent years that made deep learning uh, explode in, in all these successes uh, is that people started building much deeper neural networks than they did in the past. Um, and, and it turned out that if you have enough data, you can train these very large neural networks to, to do very well on certain tasks. So these are these deep neural networks are large models that have many tuning knobs, meaning that there's different parameters, there's different numbers that de define what the functions will be, um, and and as a result they can re they can represent very complex functions. So they can take you know huge high dimensional inputs and really manipulate them and, and reason a lot a lot uh, very complexly about them. Um, but you need lots of data to train those right? because there's because they're very complex. You need a lot of data. So that's something that's you can think of it as a, a bottleneck to uh, getting deep learning to work in certain applications. But to do this training, you have to define something called a loss function. So the, the machine learning engineer will define or the, 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 the data scientists will define or choose a loss function. And the idea behind a loss function is that it's a, a way to quantify the comparison between the prediction of the function you're considering and the true value. So suppose this is the true label. Uh, suppose that you you know you have a a, a function that looks at this uh, d diamond and predicts five, um, but we know the true label was the number of sides, which is four. Uh, and so how do you compare five to four? Now of course you know when we see these numbers, it's pretty obvious that we can compare them in a lot of ways. But again, to a computer, these are just variable values. Uh, so we have to we have to really define this for a computer. Um, so the loss is something that takes in the prediction and, and the label and, and outputs a number that represents how bad is this prediction. So here are some example losses. I can just illustrate them. These, these are not to scale. But so suppose you can plot this on a, on a, on a, on a you know, 2D graph uh, where we, the, the horizontal axis is the, the difference between the prediction and the label and then the, the vertical axis is the loss value. So one common loss function here is the absolute value of that difference. So that would look like this, uh, or you could square that difference. It would look something like this. Uh, again, both these are not to scale. I just drew these freehand or using the drawing tools and in this presentation software. Um, so the, the decision of which loss function you use strongly affects you know, what is considered the best function to choose that, that the machine learning algorithm will choose. So it's, it's really core in, um, in, in the, the effects or it has a key, a core effect on how the, how the machine learning will behave for different tasks. So this is designed by machine learning engineers to fit each problem. And the idea then is that the learning algorithm is going to search for neural networks that get, give you the smallest possible loss. And just so you have an idea of why neural networks are so powerful, the, the reason that they're so powerful is that you can do that search, you can search for the best, the, the, the smallest loss by calculating derivatives, right? So your neural networks allow you to calculate the derivative of the loss for uh, all the parameters. And if you recall what a derivative is, it's just a measure of how a function changes based on its inputs. 
right? So it's a change in the loss value over change in the parameters. So once you know how things will change, you can you can you can change the parameters to make the the loss as small as possible. So that's the story behind deep learning, or just the deep learning at a glance. So I want to talk about what machine learning, uh, where we are with machine learning today. So we'll talk about where we, what we've been able to do in recent years, uh, some of the really cool advances that have happened. And we'll talk about some of the challenges that we're trying to face or we're trying to trying to solve that the machine learning community is trying to solve. Uh, and then I want to I want to talk about things that I I just think that are common misconceptions about machine learning that are, are things that we're just never going to be able to do with machine learning. So. Um, in recent years, one of the biggest changes is just our, our ability with machine learning tools to process complex inputs like images. Right? So images are really complex because if you think about you know what's going on, there's you know there's pixels, uh, you know aligned in a grid, but somehow the pixels you know mean something. Right? That's kind of a complicated idea for a computer, and we've been able to do things like like identify certain categories of objects in images, and we can do that pretty well. Uh, you can try this out. You know, if you have Google Photos or Apple's Apple's Photos tool, you can search by object, right? You don't have to label these, your, your um, photo libraries, but you can actually just search for cats in your, in your, in your photo libraries and, and it'll discover most of the images of cats, um, you know, by actually analyzing the, the pixels. Um, so this is something that's been able to be done. Uh, and then there's, there's variations on this where you can detect them in the image rather than just detecting whether they're present. You can identify where they are, or you can actually ident identify the pixels that correspond to each to each type of object. So these are, you know, there's this is not solved, uh, but this is something that the machine learning has made computers a lot better at in recent years. Um, machine learning has also been used to generate synthetic data, or, or more importantly, it's been used to learn about the distribution of data. Um, and so people have demonstrated this on images of people, people's faces. Uh, so there's, there was a New York Times article very recently that was talking about how, you know, there's different companies that are, that are generating synthetic images of individuals to use for, um, you know, things like, like stock photos or, um, you know, placing in advertisements. And so you don't have to pay anybody for these because these people don't actually exist. There's also a website called this person does not exist dot com uh, that where you can just reload it and you get a new image of an individual that is not a real human, but looks very realistic. Uh, so, you know, machine learning or deep learning tools have been used to create these types of things. Uh, also, recently, there's been a lot of really imp impressive progress on on generating text. Right. So where a machine learning tool studies lots and lots of texts from the internet, from libraries and so on, and then is able to generate text given some prompt. And so this is an example of completely computer generated text and it looks very realistic. It looks like a human wrote this. Similarly, machine translation has made, made some major leaps in recent years. All, a lot of these leaps are based on deep learning. Again, this is based on data sets of translations that people have been able to take advantage of and train a complicated deep neural network that can read text as input and figure out what that text should look like in a different language. And I've put this example here to be for, or for fun, but I actually don't know. I don't read Russian, so I don't know if I don't, I don't know if the, the Cyrillic translation or the Russian translation is any good. Um, and, you know, as I record this video, just this week or a few days ago, there was some major news that machine learning tools have have made significant progress on figuring out how to estimate the 3D structure of proteins given the sequence of, pro of, uh, of molecules in the protein. Again, this is based on deep learning methods and, and kind of cleverly coming up with what the data should be to train that deep learning method. In this case, it's not simply just looking at a bunch of you know, measured examples, but it's also based on taking cleverly taking advantage of simulation and, and computer generated ways of, of estimating these uh, more expensive computer methods for generating these shapes. So there's been other successes like uh, game playing artificial intelligences. There's, there was recent big news a few years ago about Go, where for a long time, machine learning methods had trouble or AI methods had trouble beating humans in Go. And uh, recently they've now surpassed humans in their 
ability to play. Uh, there's, you know, there's continued progress on making machine learning and AI methods for chess. And recently there's been some attempts to try to do for real time games like Starcraft. Machine learning has played an important role in remote sensing, which occurs in lots of, uh, or is useful in, in lots of fields. Uh, most prominent, or I think one of the more newsworthy recent developments was in space imagery, where uh, the image of the black hole was generated by using machine learning to fill in the details that we didn't, that we, that we couldn't actually measure. Um, there's lots of work on video processing. You know, you sort of see videos on YouTube where people take old, old films and make them higher resolution with machine learning tools. Uh, you can figure out, you know, 3d structure from 2d videos. There's lots of interesting examples there. Um, okay. So lots of cool stuff happening, but there's also shortcomings. So I want to talk about three particular shortcomings of machine learning today that we're trying to address our machine learning research is trying to address. One is the question of robustness. Um, a lot of these machine learning tools have been discovered to be not robust, meaning that you can make small changes to the input to what was learned and cause intentionally cause the prediction to be wrong. So here's an example of a, uh, of an image classifier and the the idea is that you know you take in an image or the, the computer will read in an image and and decide what you know what is the main object in the image in this case you know this is a this is a particular example where it got the you know got the the prediction correct where it looks at this image of a panda and predicts that it is a panda um, but what people found in experiments is that you can uh, you can pass in you can add a small amount of noise a small amount of these seemingly random pixel values um, to that image. So you get the image on the right. And to a human, that image on the right doesn't look any different from the, from the image on the left. Like it, maybe if you stare at it, you might notice the noise is a little bit different, like just natural uh, photographic noise. It looks a little bit different. But what happens to the machine learning algorithm is that it now thinks this is a gibbon with 99% confidence, right? So you've completely fooled the machine learning algorithm with a imperceptible change. So there's lots of work on how to avoid this, um, but this is a, a, an area where machine learning kind of intersects with cybersecurity because the worry is that people could, could figure this out and, and exploit this to somehow manipulate a machine learning algorithm. Another really important shortcoming of machine learning is that it really doesn't understand context. And as a result, it can do things that are really unfair. Um, so one, one example of this situation occurs when you have training data that doesn't really come from the distribution that you're going to apply the the learned model on or the learned function on. So just to kind of car give a cartoon example of this, go back to our shape counting example before or the shape edge counting uh, be from before. So suppose we trained on this data on the left, but then we when we go to test it, we actually are in the in the 3D world and we're dealing with 3D shapes. So what will happen in this situation is that the machine learning algorithm will kind of do unexpected things, or, or rather, we can't really predict how it's going to behave. This, this is a question of generalization. Um, so we don't really know how well the machine learning algorithm will generalize to 3D shapes, um, but we can guess that the more weird the shape looks to, uh, to, from a 2D perspective, the more wrong the machine learning algorithm will be. But there's something I want to highlight here, which is that in this particular example, the circles and the spheres look really similar and they both have one side, right? In two dimensions, they have one side and in three dimensions, they also have one side. So what will happen in this situation is that the circles or the spheres, when this model is deployed, the spheres will get really good performance, right? So they'll get really good predictions um, and everybody else will get really bad predictions. And what you end up with is unfair treatment of different types of inputs. In this case, the spheres would get really good treatment and everybody else would get bad treatment. Um, so this is just a, you know, obviously a cartoon example, but you can quickly imagine how this generalizes or how this applies to humans when they're, when they're being treated with machine learning algorithms. Um, and so I want to bring up, you know, there, there's a lot of solutions people are trying to come up with, um, but I want to say that nothing is a, nothing is an, uh, a panacea, nothing fixes everything. Um, so cross-validation doesn't really help in this set, in this setting, because your raw data or your real data just, just doesn't look like your raw data. So even if you split off some data, you, it doesn't look right. 
Um, collecting more representative data doesn't always help. It sometimes helps. That's usually a good thing to start with, right? If you if you know that you're you're you know if you have lots of data about tall people but don't have a lot of people a lot of um, uh, data about shorter people, then you know you should probably get some data about you know people who have lower heights. Um, so. But that doesn't completely fix most problems. Uh, and then also, there's all these algorithms that people have been inventing in recent years to mitigate unfairness, and they don't always help. And in fact, they can make things worse because a lot of times, you know, you you fall into the trap of thinking, oh, this algorithm was trained using a machine learning al a machine learning method that considers fairness, so therefore it must be fair. Well, that's not necessarily true. So people need to be really careful about that. Uh, and the other couple of things I want to talk about are. Uh, explainability and interpretability, um, you know, machine learning methods, especially deep learning methods, are really hard to understand, meaning that they're, you, they're just a bunch of numbers. And so how do you understand why the computer made a decision that it made? Um, people are working on ways to build methods that reliably provide that information. But it's it's definitely not done yet, right? We're very, we're very much lacking in that ability. Um, and then lastly, I want to talk about data cost. So deep learning methods are really expensive and they meaning, uh, sorry, they're expensive in a specific way, uh, which is that they need lots and lots of data. Uh, they're expensive in other ways too, but I think the bigger cost is, is needing lots and lots of data. So this is an illustration that was uh, generated by the Hugging Face company um, where they were trying to argue that some of these uh, natural language processing models have been growing massively in size in recent years. But uh, but yeah, th this is illustrative across. Uh, so this is showing how many parameters these ne deep neural networks uh, have. Um, but implicitly in this, you also have the need for more data to fit those parameters. In fact, there's a rule of thumb that I don't think people still subscribe to. But a long time ago, there was a, a few years ago, there was a rule of thumb that said that uh, uh, for every parameter you have in your machine learning model, you need 10 examples, at least. So when you have these you know, data set, uh, these models, these deep learning models that have like, in this case, it was 8 trillion, no, 8 billion, 8 billion example of uh, parameters. You need 80 billion examples to fit that, which is, that's not necessarily the true number, but you need a huge number. So lots of challenges in the, so, and, and of course there are, there are active lines of research trying to address these problems. So lastly, the last bit I want to get to is just the question, this question of like, so I mentioned these things where we're trying to fix these issues, right? The machine learning is not ready to solve these problems yet, but here's some examples of things that machine learning is just not going to be able to do. So number one, machine learning can never learn something that will predict things when you don't have relevant evidence. Um, so I'm thinking of examples in recent years where people have tried to figure out or try to train machine learning tools to predict criminality uh, or job performance from face images, right? Unless you're talking about, um, you know, modeling or, or you know, screen acting. And in some cases, you know, customer service or something, uh, usually a person's face appearance has nothing to do with their job performance. Uh, and when it comes to criminality, it certainly has nothing to do with their, 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 their you know, how, how likely they are to commit crimes. Um, there's just there's just there's just not evidence there in the in, in the pixels describing an image of a person's face to predict these things. So what machine learning will do instead, if you give it this task, is it will look for some arbitrary patterns that might be present in your training data, but are, I just don't shouldn't be in your in your real in the real world. Another thing machine learning can't do number two is that it can't generalize anything with certainty. Right, so when you when you give somebody uh, or when you give a machine learning algorithm a, an example that it hasn't seen before, there's always some probability that it's going to get it wrong. It's going to make some wrong assessment about that that example. This is even the case for, or maybe even per, especially the case the case for for methods that output some kind of, you know, confidence score. Because that confidence score is just also is just kind of a guess as well. So. So people, will, I want I want people to not fall into the trap of thinking that this machine learning any machine learning algorithm can know anything with certainty. The only thing it can know with certainty is that if it if you give it the exact example that was in its training set, it can kind of know what historically happened because it recorded that. Meaning, if you you know in the age prediction task, if you give it 
you know, if I was in the training set and then you, it, you ask it again, what my age is. Yeah. I can give you my age, but it can't give the age of someone else who's the same height as me because it doesn't know. It doesn't know for sure. And then lastly, what machine learning cannot do is learn reliably from only unreliable examples. Uh, in other words, garbage in, garbage out, right? That's still true with machine learning as it is with you know, much of computer, much of computing. Because machine learning is so exciting, people often fall into the trap of thinking that it will kind of find, uh, it, will, it will sort of make reliability out of unreliable inputs. And that's just not going to happen. I want it, but as you know, I guess as a, as, as a counterpoint, you should consider that it can, machine learning can learn from unreliable examples if it's given other information, other more reliable information. But if it's only given un unreliable information, it will only give un unreliable prediction. Okay, so to summarize, I, I covered everything I think I wanted to cover. So, so to summarize, I, I gave you an, an example of a simple machine learning algorithm that that's very that I, is actually very powerful, which is nearest neighbor learning. Then I went went over some broader views of machine learning, uh, and I talked about you know challenges that machine learning might face, like generalization. Uh, I gave you a glance of of deep learning, which is, you know most people who do machine learning these days are interested in. Uh, and then I talked about the cutting edge. I talked about the questions of you know what machine learning can do today, what machine learning can do soon, uh, or might be able to do soon, and what machine learning almost certainly will never do. Um, I hope that helps you know people who are interested or involved in machine learning, but who don't have the need to study the really nitty gritty technical details. All right. Uh, and since I want to post this on YouTube, thank you for watching all the way to the end. I think it's a YouTube tradition to ask people to post comments. So yeah, go ahead and post comments. I, I think one thing that's interesting is I want to hear what you all think about what else machine learning cannot do, right? What are other examples of things that machine learning cannot do or more precisely can never do? All right. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts.